Welcome back. We are Two Player Ones, and today we're going to do our top ten list. And we're going to just go back and forth and uh, say what our top ten favorite games. <laughs> so my number ten is Nino Kuni. Um, it's a Studio Ghibli. Ghibli. <laughs> the cutscenes are hand drawn by Studio Ghibli, which is really cool, and um, the. Uh, art style in game is actually pretty consistent with the cutscenes, so I didn't find it too weird to go from like 2D traditional animation to like 3D rendered graphics. It has. Uh, but it's not like it's not turn-based battle. It's like active. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, you like walk around the playing field and like fight, so you can like avoid getting hit. Um, I'm really bad at it. <laughs> I'm sort of stuck right now. I haven't beaten it. We haven't beaten all these games. Well, you probably have. Yeah, I've beaten most of them actually, but yeah, I haven't beaten it yet. It's just I wanted it to be on the list just because I'm I really love the idea of doing the graphics traditionally animated and like bringing in that style. And it sort of was um, one of the few one of the games that got me interested in these artistic video games that are sort of cropping up now that they have the technology. So that's sort of why they can rebuild him. They can rebuild him. And, but the story is really interesting and it's totally surreal and totally fits in the studio Ghibli. So it really feels like you're playing a Ghibli movie, which is pretty neat, I've got to say. You know, it's like just like surrealist like Totoro and like weird and Japanese. And so. I think a Princess Mononoke video game would kick oh my ass. Oh my god, that would be so amazing. That would be number one. Like that would just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well if they made it good. Yeah. Um, so my number 10, and there's a cat now. <laughs> Come here. So my number 10 is Bravely Default. We've often talked about how Final Fantasy has a big problem in that it's just so like, what are these fruity anime characters doing in this massive like RPG fantasy like tale that we want to like experience with like, there's like steampunk elements and like giant monsters and everyone's just a, like a pink, fruity character. <laughs> but the idea is that nowadays, they could do, they have the graphics technology to make a game look like the, like the artwork. Mm -hmm. So why, why would you make the, continue to make them like really lame anime characters who continue to have less and less like interesting character development? <laughs> just, sorry, I just love how we're supposed to be talking about games. And okay. No, well, it was my fault. Yeah, you your fault for going on a tangent. But yeah, so Bravely Default is a game that does that, where you feel like it's all the artwork. It's it's the it's the concept art that has made it into the game, and it looks painterly. It looks interesting. Um, the battle system is really fun, and I was able to challenge myself because you can choose your own challenge, kind of, because it has difficulty settings throughout the game. So if there's some boss where it's like. I don't want to have to look up a strategy, but I also don't want to have to like deal with it. You can just turn the, the difficulty down and win. Um, that said, I still had like a lot of fun with it, and there were still challenges. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to beat the game. Well, you beat it like two days ago. I just, I just <laughs> beat it recently, despite getting it when it first came out. Um, the story is outstanding. Aaron wants to play it, so I won't talk about it. But uh, the, once you get a certain amount through the game, the title screen like gave me like a heart attack because <laughs> um, there's a lot of there's a lot of suspicion and a lot of weird things being thrown out there and and people are saying things that you don't understand and you're saying things that you don't understand and then the title screen says something that you don't understand uh, and so that's a little bit unnerving the payoff is pretty immense I feel bad that it took so long to get there for me because I did take like a, mo a couple months break um, but once I managed to tie together in my brain all the story elements, I was like, dang. So my number nine, The World Ends With You. And this is a DS game that came out, I guess, oh, maybe five years ago, six years ago, something like that, maybe seven. I don't know, it was a while ago. And it really, I, it totally grabbed my attention right away the second I started playing because the cutscenes were across both screens. And I thought that was super cool. That was the first DS game I had ever played that d did that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, the battle system is like it's I'm kind of rusty because I, I haven't played it in like four years but the battle system is interesting uh kind of repetitive but the story is absolutely awesome it's kind of like a battle royale setup 
you get through this game and you like think you win and then they're like by the way, plot twist, and you're like only a quarter of the way through the game. Yeah, I think so that's good. So super awesome, because I was like, you know, I, and I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm getting close to the end of the game because they keep counting down the days, right? And you have to like keep getting through and hitting these clues and hitting these points in the story to like keep progressing through and make sure that your character's alive. And then all of a sudden they're like, ha 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 ha, you thought this was the end. <laughs> nice. Sucks to be you. So it was cool, and it just like, it keeps sort of like, it almost is kind of like a little Groundhog Day thing too, where like you kind of go back and see things from other perspectives a little bit, but you're still moving the plot forward. And the art style is great. Uh, they're like in 2D with like just sort of reactions, like they're not fully animated, um, but they're they're really neat. And uh, I I will say just play it for the story. My number nine is Halo Two. Still my favorite Halo game. Uh, so Halo 2, in my opinion, has the best music of the series. I liked playing as the Arbiter. I'm a fan of Keith David, so I thought his voice acting really brought the character out. I'm not wearing my Gargoyle shirt, but that would be a, a pretty big giveaway. I feel like without the second one, there wouldn't have been as much for uh, expanded universe people to write books about and stuff like that. Everything that they added was, like, every every element of 2 was a step up from 1. The graphics were such a big step up from the first one. I know if you go back and play it now, it looks awful, but that's what <laughs> that's what the anniversaries are for. <laughs> There's so much different epic moments, and, like, the quotes are so memorable. Cortana was at her Cortana-iest, most sarcastic. Halo 4 gave it a run for the money. When I finished Halo 4, I just sat back quietly and I was like, man, this game should win awards. Halo has always had a hard time with climactic battles, mm -hmm. and Halo 2 does have the most boss fighty boss fight with Tartarus, but he's such a chump. You just wait for Johnson to shoot him, and then you shoot him, and then you wait for Johnson to shoot him, and then you shoot him, and then that's it. My number eight uh, is the other game that I haven't beaten on my list. It's South Park the Stick of Truth. Holy shit, it is like, it's like everyone who told me it's essentially like playing the show. I was like, okay, you know, whatever. Immediately when I played it, I was like, this is like an episode of the show. <laughs> like, it was, it's so great. It's, uh, the battle system's fun, you know, magic is farts, and it's like, it never gets like, you, you know, like... My little pony, <laughs> magic is farts. Um, <laughs> it's, a. Uh, it's got like good customization, you can make your character look however you want. I mean it kinda sucks that like you can't play as a girl, but like I have girly hair and a girly outfit, so it doesn't really matter. Like and your name, like I love like it's just a great introduction to the game is you type in your name and they're like, Oh, so your name is douchebag, right? <laughs> they're like, So what do you think, douchebag? And then they don't say anything and they're like, Right, let's go do this. Yeah, <laughs> and how your like, parents your parents are like uh, why don't you come down and talk to us? And then you come down and you stand still for a moment and they're like, God, I hate that kid so much. <laughs> yeah. It, it feels like an RPG, but it also feels like a South Park game. And they like bring in all the jokes from the show. Like, you know, you go up, um, Mr. Slay's asshole. <laughs> and you know, you get abducted by aliens. You just, you hit all the, the funny points of the show, but it's also like really original, the story itself. And it's just like... I, I'm really enjoying it, so I had to add that on my list even though I haven't beaten it yet, because I, uh, I really like South Park and I was just like so impressed. Okay, so my number eight is Duke Nukem 3D. Maybe the first first person shooter I ever played. Wow. Thinking back on it. What was it originally on? Oh, maybe I... No, no, I think I played it before I played Goldeneye. It's a PC game. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure it's the first first person shooter I ever played. Uh, also the first adult oriented game I ever played. Uh, the first really, really funny game I ever played. And uh, just a lot of... It's just really awesome. It's kind of like the Evil Dead of uh, video games, eh? Like a little bit? Like... Where they had two games that were like, these are side scrollers where you shoot aliens. And the third one is like, got actual Army of Darkness quotes in it. Yeah. Really awesome. All the one-liners made me uh, come to enjoy the 80s movies that I would eventually watch after uh, a lot more. You know, I, I, I watched Army of Darkness after playing Duke Nukem. And my favorite quote was always the, I'm here to chew bubblegum and kick ass and I'm all out of bubblegum. And I didn't even know about They Live until like <laughs> university, so... Uh, so you'd say that and people would give was, weird looks. Yeah, I was like seven or eight when I played Duke Nukem. <laughs> They'd be like... He's seen They Live, but you just played Duke Nukem. Yeah, yeah. So number seven 
Uh, I've got Fable on my list. Uh, I'm gonna have to decide, I know that 3 is like your least favorite, but for me 3, I felt a little bit more validated, like that they would call you like princess if you were a girl and stuff, so that was kind of nice that they like would react to me as if I was a woman. I will say 1 is slit, you know, kind of different from the other 2, like 2 and 3 seem quite like similar along the same vein, but then 1 I can totally see like where they had a few limitations, but then also where they had like that initial spark of creativity. Well, I just, well, I, mean, it's, yeah, I just know that I the dude it. like made a lot of lies about the first one, or he he like came he up with hopes. things. Yeah, <laughs> came up with hopes, and then he would like be quick to tell the press about his hopes, yeah. and they were like, "He's this is gonna be in the game." Yeah, and like trees would be that grow and stuff, and uh, seasons yeah. that change, and it's like ah. Yeah. <laughs> but I really liked the first one. We didn't have a lot of games on our original Xbox, and Fable was mine. But yeah, Fable one I liked. Uh, Fable two, I thought, like I said, Fable two I thought was the best one, and then. Fable 3 had a lot of problems. See, yeah, I but will, we, also, we, we played, played it together, yeah. and I will say that 3 was a little bit easier to play together, because 2 was sometimes glitchy. The camera is it, very the, Yeah, the camera was super limited. 3 it had a little, like, more space to it, and you could, like, play together and have it not be a problem. I will say when we played 3, and we both had our dogs with us, that was so annoying. <laughs> They'd both be, like, barking and running yeah. around, and you're like, ugh, yeah. one dog is too much. We didn't have a lot of two-player games, so it was kind of nice that Spencer was like, Oh, you want to play Fable? I can come into your game and play with you. <laughs> yeah, and then you could make progress, but I could still be my super yeah, powerful self. Yeah, and so it was awesome. So I didn't like, and so I like totally was able to cheap out and like not have to do anything. I could kill bosses. Would, like, kill I could everybody. kill bosses with like three magic moves, and she'd be like, "Hey, all of hundred percent experience." Yeah, and you'd like give me money and stuff, and that was cool. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I, I funded your entire saving of the world. I really enjoyed the two player aspect. Okay, my number seven is Magi Nation, which is another RPG, Game Boy Color game. Uh, originally, Zach really played a lot of it, and then I kind of uh, watched. It's really funny. It's It's got kind of a really chill uh, style to it. Uh, you play as Tony Jones. <laughs> nice. Phony Bones, as the bullies at the beginning of the games want to call you. Really interesting. It, it's kind of weird because it's like it's kind of like a Pokemon thing, where it's based on a card game, except the, you know the other way around for Pokemon. But it it's not based on a card game. It just your your monsters are in in the format of a card game, kind children's of. Children's playing. A children's game. playing card game. But interesting, unique type of monsters. It had very uh, specified, very fungal uh, themes to the art design. See, that's kind of a Japanese thing, the mushrooms. Like... Well, it's, the whole game is set underground. Oh, okay. So but in like, in like a new world where there is sky and stuff, but it's like underground. Weird. Um, the names of things are really like funny and like, like Vashna Room. The first character you meet talks to you and you can't understand him because he's speaking a different language. And he says a few, his, his words just come out as random words. And one of the things he says is taxi apple sponge. <laughs> uh, and I've always that always was like really funny and memorable. <laughs> and then there's just like it's kind of surreal. Like you'll go up and you'll look at a picture of on the wall, and it's like oh look, there's a picture of a cat on the wall, and it'll be like meow. And you'll be like the hell, <laughs> like, the cat picture just talked to me. <laughs> um, so it's that it's just like that kind of experience, like a world that's really goofy, but also super serious. And then the boss of the game is like is like there to judge you. <laughs> And you're like, holy crap, I did not sign up for this. Um, and it has a few hidden choices you can make to alter the end of the game. Not a super big deal, but like, um, it's a really complicated process to get that uh, cloud frond and uh, save, save Orlon. So we're on number six now. Mine is Kingdom Hearts 2. Uh, I didn't actually play them until late high school, early university. Because I never had my own PlayStation 2 and Malcolm sold it to get his PlayStation 3. So I played Kingdom Hearts 1 and I felt like 2 was easier, um, kind Can of not in a good way. From what I've seen, Kingdom Hearts 1 has some control issues. It does have some control issues, so it felt like Kingdom Hearts 2 fixed that, but it also made the, the uh, fights easier. So, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag, but I did play it for, like, it, it's kind of a really special game. Uh, the graphics are better, uh, the story is uh, 
weirdly complicated and hard to explain, but it totally makes sense when you're playing it. Like, Kingdom Hearts is one of the games where you're like, so yeah, there's like, everyone has a nobody, but then like, sometimes you have two, and this one is like, this one does that, and then they're like, what? And you're like, just play the game and then you'll understand. Don't get me started on Kingdom Hearts 3, but let's move on to yours. Yes. <laughs> My number six, I, I don't know if I want to talk too much about it, it's Portal 2, because everyone knows Portal 2. So number five, we normally don't do two things, but it came on the whatever. same disc, so whatever. Uh, Journey and Flower. Flower and Journey, no text, it's just a visual experience. I had the most amazing experience playing Journey, because it had just come out, so there were people online playing, and it's a really fluid online experience, you don't get to see people's names. They just show up and you're like, oh, there's a person there, you can ignore them. They'll disappear after a while, join somebody else's game, or, you know, you can play around with them. And I got to a point where it started getting dark, and there was this, this scary dragon, and so me and this other person are, like, walking, and then we end up the outside, and it turned into, like, a scene from a fucking movie. It was amazing. I ran and hid underneath this thing. And they didn't get there in time, and the dragon just swooped down and ate them right in front of me. And it was so amazing, and I was like, holy shit, this game just became real for me. Yeah. And it was just so, like, it was just the perfect first experience. I thought that, I thought that you were both hidden, and then the dragon did a pass by, but then it immediately showed up and attacked. But that the person that was hidden beside you tried to run to the oh, next hiding spot, that might have also been and, th happened. and then they got attacked, and you were like, you're hubris! This was the first game where I was like, this is where games need to go, because holy shit, there was no talking in this game, and I felt like totally invested, and like 100% there the whole time. I was never brought out of the experience at all, right? So I just thought that was cool. And same with Flower, it just sort of like, it, you know, you're a, a petal, you're collecting petals, but then like, shit got real, and it got all environmental on my ass, and, but it wasn't preachy. It was just like sad, you know? It was this flower trying to make its way through this like industrial mess and it was like really wonderful and you know, really cool experience. So I definitely suggest the, the journey package. It's like 30 bucks. After playing it, I was like, if games don't like this, if this is the indie game movement, I'm totally on board. Like, holy shit, I need to see more games like this. Bastion, honorable mention. <laughs> yeah, honorable mention to Bastion, my favorite, my favorite indie game. My number five is Star Tropics. It's a Nintendo uh, game, so it was, it was created by a, a, a Nintendo studio. A first party Nintendo game. <laughs> <laughs> that um, makes more sense than your, it's a Nintendo game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was made by Japanese people, people in Japan. They wanted to make games specifically for a North American audience. So they wanted to make one that a game that was uh, based on their knowledge of America, essentially. So, the main character plays baseball. The first weapon's a yo-yo. <laughs> Most of the characters you come across are like tubby bastards. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, a really cool game. If, if anything, it's, a, it's like a sister game to the original Legend of Zelda. It's so unique and fun. Funny when, when it has to be. Devious and intense and awesome and there's like giant snakes and giant octopuses and a genie and just so much and a ghost uh, uh, lots of ghosts but one giant ghost spooky ghost spooky ghost uh, ectoplasm it's it's just a really fun game and it's really underrated probably because it was made for north america so japan didn't buy into it as much and yeah it's it has a pretty pretty strong cult following but I've never met anyone in person who play, played it as much as me or really knew about it. And I, I think more people should play it. So number four, Heavy Rain. I watched Malcolm play this when it first came out. I think he rented it from the video store back in the day. Oh. <laughs> um, Don't date us now, dear. It was kind of like, I had already seen the Saw movies, I think, so it was kind of like a Saw feel to it, but it was a lot more like invested in its characters, a lot more um, focused on just like their story, their motivations, and really like the timing of everything was so great. Like I, I like the loading screens, they like load enough for you so you go through this entire scenario before having to hit another loading screen. So you don't like walk around loading screen show cutscene. It's like 
You walk around, the loading, interact with something, the cutscene shows up right away, the and it like, screens, feels like The totally loading good. screens were between chapters. Yeah, between chapters. You only saw a loading screen, well, I guess maybe it went black and there was like a little bit flashing loading screen. But yeah, it was It was always like there, but there was, it had finished the scene. To, like, it minimi was essentially yeah, like to minimize that, there was major loading screens where you'd get a close-up of the characters' faces, and you'd kind of like experience their turmoil mm -hmm. just through their expression. And actually, what I didn't know about it is that they did motion capture for the face faces and for the walking. So that's why it feels so, like, it feels like totally like a, a film noir kind of like horror thing, you know, like it's just really, really awesome and just like the characters just feel so real, like just so, f like so fleshed out and like... Sean! Sean! <laughs> yeah. Sean! <laughs> but it's an awesome game. Uh, he'll be like, he'll, yeah. <laughs> he'll be like off screen and like, and like a hundred feet away and he'll just hear, Ooh! and two characters are like having a serious conversation <laughs> on like a balcony and they're like, you're like a, you're a dick. And he's like, well, you're fucked up. And he's like, Ooh! holy shit. When you find out who the killer is, you're like, um, I felt really betrayed and really like, it was awesome. And Erin uh, knew when she played through, but I didn't, so she yeah. was like, I know who it is. Yeah, but you, I, you were done. you surprised, like, or did you sort of figure it out? I figured out a couple things. I think you told me an important bit that I clued together. It was satisfying. Um, there's lots of, there's multiple endings. You can, you know, do scenarios in different ways. Essentially like a whole game of quick time events. But it makes use of the PlayStation controller to its full extent. There's a it's driving like, scene, it's and I was like, the only game that does. Yeah, it was, but it was like so, like it was so immersive, and I didn't feel like it was just like tap X, tap that. It was like holy shit, I'm driving backwards on a highway. <laughs> like I'm actually, like I really felt like part of the action. It essentially felt like a movie that I was part of, and I was taking part of the ride, so it was pretty neat. Uh, my number four is StarCraft and the Brood War expansion, the first, so the first StarCraft game. The story is so intense and just everything that happens and all the shit that gets poured on the Tassadar's face and Zeratul, they just both get completely obliterated by, by everyone around them. And it really just comes down to there's, there's like three people in the universe that are trying to do really good, Raynor, Tassadar, and Zeratul. And everyone is trying to kill those three people because they're getting in their way. And Kerrigan is just like the coolest evil thing of all time. So many quotable lines. Like I always loved uh, Kerrigan's like, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much queen bitch of the universe right now. So, uh, and uh, just that kind of thing. Just the fact that every character has something you can just click until they say something funny. There's just so much variety in, in play style and the story is just so strong and the characters are... Every character's the most devious character, except for the good guys who are just like, I just want to go straight shoot and I keep getting fucked over. Especially, especially Zeratul is my favorite character. It's like a real war. It's just all, it's just all fucking fake and on paper. Mm -hmm. But they put the steps in to make you think that like, were these things happening, this is the way that they would really happen. Majora's Mask. This was really hard because I wanted to say Ocarina of Time, but Majora's Mask is just so like emotionally charged and so like focused in its like ideas, you know? I felt like in Ocarina of Time you're like, you're the hero, you're saving Zelda, like, and that's all fine and good, but this one is more just about like, not just saving the people, but emotionally reconciling with them, you know? Like dealing with grief and loss and you know helping everyone along those that stages the stages of like fear and like desperation and just seeing how they progress over the days and how they get more and more desperate or sad weird surreal sad world to just sort of float around the world in. kind of acts as his as his voice it's yeah i, I mean it's all this and is all theory that yeah, people have talked about but i will say that they say you know forgive your friend and that totally makes sense in, that it is navi that he lost her somehow like she died or she left even as a kid i felt like so sad about andrew I felt like sad about Skull Kid and I like didn't understand anything like I didn't even know what grief was at that point and I still felt the sadness emanating out of the game. Yeah. So I think that that's really why I picked it and it just 
just the first line of the game totally sets it up. You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Is uh, Golden Sun, The Lost Age, which is Golden Sun 2, I guess. Fun characters, it's an RPG, turn-based RPG. Puzzles are a big part of this game. It's just a really, it's so big, is, is an important part of it for a Game Boy Advance game. Every, every perspective you have from the first game gets turned around and you start to realize that what you thought was true is actually not true. I will say the challenge is not a massive part of it. Bosses certainly are challenging, but outside of that, there's a lot of ways that you can get magic back, so healing is never really that big of an issue. One, one of the most important things about it is that uh, for a Game Boy Advance game, it has really, really, like, radical music. I don't, I don't even know how they managed to, but it's got like real drum kit noises. The lighthouses have really good music. The, the Mars lighthouse has just, just crazy. I was like, what the fuck is this? This isn't even, this isn't even like, this is real music. This isn't game music. <laughs> but the characters, the story, the fact that in the second game, if you didn't do something in the first game, then it doesn't happen in the second game. Oh, that's interesting because you used a code, you, right? Because you used a code okay, to bring your cool. characters over. So you have to, if you don't collect everything from the first game, your characters come over and they don't have everything. Ooh. So you need to get all the Jin in the first game in order to have them all in the second game. There's wow. characters that you can help, and if you talk to them like one more time and tell them how much, like, they'll, they'll be like, you meant a lot, thanks for like saving this dude who was trapped under a rock. But if you don't go back and talk to them, they don't show up in the next game. Oh. And there's actually one character who um, gives you a gold ring, but only if you go back, you have, like, there's a lot that happens with her, and you'll move forward, and then, this is in the first game, and you have to go back to the town and talk to her, but you never have to go back to the town for any other reason except to talk to her, and she's like, thanks. <laughs> but in the second game, if you happen to have that conversation where you say, where she says thanks, she'll be there looking for you because she has a crush on your character. Really long and great story and game. My number two is Portal 2. So this is the only game that Spencer and I both have on our list. Portal 1 is like short and sweet. When you realize what's going on, you're like, oh shit, you know, but it's like pretty like straightforward and whatever, right? 2 is like really, really, really long. I got to a point and I was like, Spencer, am I even close to the end of the game? And you're like, no, you're about halfway through. I loved Wheatley. I think everybody fucking loves Wheatley. And I'm like, fuck, he's totally gonna fucking betray me. And then when he does, it's still like so upsetting. You're like, God damn it, Wheatley. Like, I really liked you. I really, you know, he was just so weird and, and funny. The ending is fucking satisfying as balls. Okay, we're gonna have to beat that out. The achievement for that is, did that just happen? Yes, it did. Multiplayer. Oh, yeah, the, oh, the multiplayer was great. And actually, I loved the free DLC. I won't spoil it. But it's actually like you play, like you should play the game on your own first. And then do the multiplayer. And the free DLC actually like shows what's happened at the end of like, after the end of the, the one player game. And you kind of just go, oh my god. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like another like what the fuck moment. It it took all the good aspects of the first game and just amped it all up, right? Like, did you feel that way too? Yeah. Um, the only thing it couldn't do was the mystique, because like in the first one, you, oh, you at the beginning know. you don't know yeah. anything, That's and true. then at the end you're like, well, well, well. We'll see Wheatley kind of acted like that, though. But that's the first thing that happens in I that guess. game. I guess. He's like, ha 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 ha, like, damn it! Yeah. <laughs> 20 minutes into the game, I've been upset. Yeah. That's not quite as, su as surprising yeah. at the end of the game. So. I guess. Well, I'm sorry that I had to be yeah. bleeped out. Dragon Warrior 4, or Dragon Quest 4, if you're uh, so inclined. Oh. Fucking cat. But uh, as a kid, my brother played it, and... You name your character, and then the first chapter of the game, you play as some dude named Rengar. And uh, I thought that was weird, because it's like every other game, you name your character, and that's the character's name. But in Dragon Warrior 4, there's five chapters, and each chapter you play as someone different. And it's in the fifth chapter that you realize that the name you gave is the character from the fifth chapter. <laughs> it waited to give us our name. This is, this is us. It wasn't that pink soldier guy. It wasn't that tomboy girl from the second one. It's this dude in green. I think my brother's favorite is Dragon Warrior 3, but Dragon Warrior 4 to me is what got me into storytelling in general. Uh, partly because of that whole thing where like you find out that you're you in the fifth chapter, 
the fact that the characters are all so varied and different, um, the fact that there's there's a, a heel slime that wants to become a person, and then in the fourth chapter he does, he gets to. You realize that so much time has passed between the first guy and the last guy, that what you're seeing is a very different world. So yeah, it's super great game. Number one, uh, for me, is... <laughs> Final Fantasy IX. It's a close call between 7 and 9, but 9 just sort of goes back to the roots a little bit. The characters are funny. It's not as like, oh, woe is me, blah. Like, I love Final Fantasy VII, but Cloud is so bummed out all the time, and, you know, Tifa's so sad, and Eris is just like, you know, the, the end of a race. Like, she dies, and you're like, fuck, and so you're just like all upset. Uh, Nine has the danger, but it's just a little bit more lighthearted. The world is really engaging. Um, I feel like the lore fits a little bit better. Sometimes with Seven, it's kind of like a little too industrial and not as much fantasy. Like, it's kind of weird trying to, like, fit the pieces together. It's still a really great game, but sometimes I felt like it was a little bit, like, sort of jigsawed together. In Nine, it just flows beautifully. The characters are really different. You really care about them. Zidane's a really, like, a night, like, a, a good character, I think. He's, like, funny and mischievous. Like, he's, he's the thief of the group, which I think was interesting considering he was, like, the main character. Usually, like, you know, Cloud had his big sword. The and warrior Zidane, You know, Squall was, like, a warrior, too. Um, but the, he was the thief, and so it was more about, like, his deception. And, like, uh, I felt like the battle system was good. The summons were um, were different because you couldn't have everybody summon. It was just Garnet and Ico. But yeah, and like the cutscenes are great. Uh, I just like, and this is one of the first games I ever beat, like ever. I actually even got like the extra ending on it. Like I totally like a hundred percent of it, and I was really proud of myself. Okay, and my number one uh, is probably not that surprising. Is Ocarina of Time. I know that it was a long thing. I know that we tried to cut out as much as we could. So thank you for watching. Uh, if you yeah. managed to get this far, uh, we like we like games. Those some of the games we like. 